and these are the mechanisms which will produce increased reflux or increased damage to the lower esophageal area, which include uh, gastric acid secretion, acid and activated peptides. Pepsin are the key, uh, key ingredients of the gastric reflux aid producing esophagitis. Acid combines with the even small amount of pepsin can disrupt the mucosal barrier, resulting in increased permeability and histological changes. The proximal pocket of acid, which usually will be present uh, after a meal, and these acid pocket will be uh, present in the upper part of the stomach, and it will also produce uh, uh, yeah, esophagitis. Next one is duodenogastric reflux and uh, delayed gastric emptying will also uh, will produce uh, esophagitis because there will be delay in gastric emptying. So more of the um, gastric contents will be retained in the stomach and they will also produce, especially in pa patients with the diabetic gastroparesis and also in autonomic peripheral neuropathy. Next slide. Then we'll see the third tier of uh, anti-reflex mechanism. Next slide. So these are the tissue resistant, which can be divided as pre-epithelial, epithelial, and the post-epithelial defense. Next slide. Pre-epithelial defense is not much developed in esophagus and as it is in the stomach, but there will be a small a layer of uh, mucus and a buffering layer will be there in the uh, pre-epithelial area. Next slide. Epithelial different def uh, defense is very much uh, uh, developed in esophagus. There is a three cell layer uh, which will protect esophagus from all the acid uh, damage. The first layer is the stratum basalis and mid zone is a stratum spinosum and there is a five to 10 thick layer of stratum corneum. Uh, so the functional component include the ability of the esophageal epithelium to buffer it. An intracellular buffering is accompanied by negatively charged phosphates and protein as well as bicarbonate ions. So it will buffer the acid and also produces bicarbonate. Next slide. Post epithelial difference is uh, main, maintained by increased blood flow uh, to the esophagus, which delivers oxygen, nutrients, and bicarbonates, and it removes H plus and uh, carbon dioxide, and thereby it maintains a normal acid base balance. So these are the anatomical changes that, uh, that is happening and the physiological mechanism by which patients are prone for gastroesophageal reflux. Now we'll go to epidemiology. 30% of the Indian population is affected by the disease uh, in which 8% of the rural population and 25% of the urban population are affected. It is equal incidence in males and females, but the complication has said to be more in males may be due to associated smoking and alcohol intake in males. Next slide. So clinical features are uh, divided into classical symptoms, atypical symptoms or extraesophageal manifestations and its complications. Next slide. So classical symptom is heartburn is the most common symptom that patient will present to you. He will describe it as a burning feeling arising from the stomach or lower chest and radiating towards the neck, throat, and occasionally to the back. It occur usually occurs postprandially after a large meal or after ingesting a spicy citrus food which contains a lot of fat, chocolate, and alcohol. So GRD is diagnosed symptomatically by the occurrence of heartburn two or more days a week, although less frequent symptoms do not preclude the disease. Next slide. Acid regurgitation is another symptom, which is the effortless regurgitation of acidic fluid, especially after meals and worsened by stooping or supine position. Third one is dysphagia. Dysphagia is a not a common complaint, but whenever they are presenting with a long-standing heartburn, patient can have dysphagia. So in case of a patient presenting with a GERD and dysphagia, we have to rule out causes like a peptic structure, Schwarzky's ring, severe esophageal inflammation, peristaltic dysfunction, or Barrett's esophagus or carcinoma esophagus. Next slide. Then they can present with other less common symptoms like water brush, odinophagia means painful uh, swallowing. They can be a belching, blotting sensations, hiccups, nausea, nausea, vomiting, like that. Next slide. 
atypical manifestation of GRD or extra esophageal manifestation of GRD, patient can present with asthma, bronchitis, chest pain, dental erosions, and END symptoms like hoarseness, laryngitis, chronic cough, etc. So there won't be any ENT examination finding will be absolutely normal, but still patient will have these symptoms. So whenever patient is having these symptoms for a long standing time, then we have to rule out the presence of an underlying GERD. Next slide. So these are the uh, END findings in patients with the long-standing GID. They can, on endoscopy, we can see that there can be edema and hyperemia of the larynx, vocal cords, and there will be hyperemia of the larynx, interarytenoid areas, and dental erosions. These can be a, a findings or a symptom of GID also. Next slide. So whenever there is a, we are suspecting a complication, we have to be very cautious, like whether the patient is having any dysphagia or odynophagia or any upper GI bleeding, anemia or vomiting. These are the danger signs. Whenever they are presenting with these signs, we have to act much more cautiously. Next slide. So these are the differential diagnosis. Patient can uh, mimic GRD with achalasia, esophagitis, gastritis, acid-peptic diseases, esophageal cancer, polylithiasis, or irritable bowel syndrome. Next slide. So how will we diagnose it? Next slide. So diagnosis, there is no single test or gold standard test is available to diagnose GRD. Diagnostic test not needed with the classic symptoms. So whenever a patient is coming to you with the classic symptoms, you can diagnose GRD without help of any test. But the important thing is we should be knowing when to perform diagnostic test. So whenever there is an uncertainty about diagnosis or he's uh, presenting with atypical symptoms, symptoms with the complications, are, as I already told you, like dysphagia, odynophagia, vomiting, or upper GI bleed, or whenever you are treating the patient, but he's having inadequate response or he's presenting with the recurrent symptoms, and especially prior to any anti-reflex surgery, we have to go for further diagnostic test. Next slide. So empirical trial of acid separation is the simplest and most definitive method for diagnostic GRD. Apart from treating GRD, trial of PPI is also a method to diagnose GRD. So it has become the first test used in patients with the classic symptoms. So whenever a patient is presenting to you with all these GRD symptoms, you can have an initial high dose of PPI that is omeprazole 40 to 80 milligram per day for two weeks and look for a response. If there is a 50% improvement in heartburn, then the GERD, we can diagnose the patient as having GERD. Next slide. So next uh, uh, available test is uh, barium solo, useful for diagnostic test for patient with dysphagia because we can find out the stricture, whether uh, presence of a stricture, mass, but it is not as accurate as endoscopy. Next slide. Endoscopy is the uh, first test to be done in patients with the, any complications. So indications for endoscopy is patient presenting with alarm symptoms or empirical therapy fail, preoperative evaluation for anti-reflex surgery, or any other patient presenting to you with the uh, danger sign once in a lifetime endoscopy should be done. Next, next slide. Next slide. The, uh, this is the endoscopy classification of uh, reflux esophagitis. Uh, it can be graded by Savary Miller grading or by a Los Angeles grading. Here we showed Los Angeles grading of eso distal esophagitis. Here we can see that in a grade A, the lower esophageal, here you can see this is a Z line and sm small mucosal erosions are seen. If it is less than 5 mm in size, we label it as grade A esophagitis. If it is more than 5 mm, it is grade B esophagitis. Next slide. If it is involving more than one mucosal fold, but it is not circumferential, it is grade C. 
great d means circumferential involvement or associated with the esophageal narrowing then it is great d next slide Esophageal manometry has got a very limited role in diagnosing gastroesophageal reflux disease, but it can be done to assess LES pressure and LES relaxation, and also it can assess for placement of 24-hour pH catheter. Next slide. Ambulatory 24-hour pH monitoring is a gold standard for diagnosing GERD. It has got a good sensitivity and specificity. Next slide. Esophageal biopsy, the classic changes in GRD will be a basal cell hyperplasia, increased height of red tape pegs. But it is not uh, very specific for GRD. There is no need to take biopsy in all the patients where we are very sure about the diagnosis because finding will be the same. And there is no more information we are going to get from an esophageal biopsy. Then, uh, okay. The 24-hour pH monitoring here, we can uh, see that in the upper palate, you can see it is a normal 24-hour uh, pH monitoring where in which the pH less than 4, the time duration in which pH falls less than 4 is very less. Whereas in the lower image, you can see it's a patient with a GERD where the pH less than 4, the duration is much higher and the composite score or demeter score is used to calculate whether the patient is having GERD or not. Next slide. <coughs> This is the histopathology of a patient with the basal cell hyperplasia showing some neutrophilic and uh, isnophilic inflammation. 